Hi everyone. I, yeah, I'll be, be brief because um, because of time. Uh, but yeah, we've got um, talks here on uh, drawings, uh, paintings, uh, books, and yeah, the the studios, different kind of aspects, the greenhouse, the summer house, and marble carving areas. So by Stephen Feek, Jenna London Arrell, Claire Nadal, and Deborah Kane. And so yeah, without further ado, I'll pass you to Stephen. So this uh, is my current thinking about uh, a series of drawings uh, and paintings um, and how they relate to the bronze sculptures that I'm looking at, uh, having just started my PhD. So in 1956, Hepworth makes the decision to start using metal in her sculpture, first using sheet materials before concentrating on bronze. Uh, the advent of Hepworth's own Bronze Age represented a seismic shift in her practice, and she had to develop new techniques. This transition was not always a, sm a smooth one, and she often found the process frustrating. However, having committed to using metal with considerable success, a year later, everything seems to slow down. Only eight new works emerged in 1957, compared to 23 in 1956. A combination of illness and events in her personal life conspired together, and in her correspondence with Jim Eade in September 1957, she complains that the year had been a strain. Feeling physically and emotionally unable to focus on sculpture, Hepworth instead turned to drawing and painting. I should say, uh, drawing and painting are terms used quite loosely in uh, the few times that Hepworth does talk about uh, that sort of kind of activity. Um, I had largely made the decision that something on paper was a drawing, something on board was a painting, but Jenna has kindly pointed out today that uh, there are drawings on board as well. So it's something I'm getting to grips with as I go along. So uh, spring movement uh, number one is a uh, drawing that I feel particularly fond of. It's the first Hepworth I ever sold when I was working at the New Arts Center and actually began my thinking about the possibility of doing the PhD that I'm now doing. Uh, it is one of a series of drawings in black ink uh, made in this period, and she made a great number. There are, I've counted, nearly 50. Uh, using ink on paper, applied with a brush or a pen, a hard nibbed reed pen or simple dip pen, and sometimes perhaps even a bamboo cane. These works have a spontaneous looking gestural freedom and often repeat the same motifs, especially the growing plant-like form that we are seeing a lot of now. Uh, and together they can be understood to illustrate her ambitions for an openness of form that would, in theory, only be possible in metal, but not in stone or wood. She also frequently used paint uh, and, and ink applied onto a gesso prepared board, first treated with house paint, uh, and sometimes with a surprising use of vivid color. Not so vivid here. There's one a bit brighter that we'll see a little bit later on. Uh, and occasionally canvas as well. Uh, these works are often linked to Hepworth's interest in Paris Tashism, not least by Hepworth herself. Uh, and because of, the, uh, because of this lyrical, expressive use of materials, itself quite a radical departure. Um, they are united by uh, this wonderful sense of physicality. Um, they are referred to in Alan Watts' uh, Way of Zen, which I'm sure we will come to, um, as a kind of dancing on paper. And I think that's a text that uh, was influenced Hepworth a lot. Uh, the other term that's used an awful lot in relation to these is calligraphy, uh, but in a very general westernized version of what calligraphy is or was at that stage. Tashism in Britain developed primarily in opposi opposition to the geometric abstraction of the circle group and unit one and a revulsion against pre-war so-called rational systems of thought. Uh, de Stahl's exhibition in 1952 caused a sensation in London, and his thickly painted canvases appealed to some painters, while the more energetic calligraphic marks of Georges Mathieu appealed to others. Hepworth does something of both. But the importance of the Tash for Hepworth lay not in an aesthetic and ideological sensibility, but the impact it might have for a wider society as well. 
1958, sorry, she wrote to Herbert Reed, Reed Tashism, I have never since 1942 called myself a constructivist, as you know, and therefore I can say that I feel personally that of all the pulses of creation, this has moved me more profoundly than any other. The whole vitality of this stream of painting is incredibly close to research being done by physicists at the moment and by medical research into the source of vitality of healing of wounds, etc. It seems to me very bound up with the aesthetic perceptions of such fundamental rhythms and impulses of growth, growth and form. This is a personal digression, please forgive me, prompted by reading your fine contribution to the Thames and Hudson book. Typically of Hepworth's letters to read, uh, she conflates her interest in art and science and her belief that sculpture especially, though also painting one presumes, could play a fundamental positive role for humankind in general. Although Hepworth expresses her interest in Tashism, she does not herself call, does not call herself a Tashist. Rather, it offered a different, new, and exciting version of abstraction, one of a growing number of poss possibilities for her and her painter peers, including Alan Davy, William Gear, Patrick Heron, Roger Hilton, Lanyon, Brian Winter, amongst others, all of whom move in and out of the Tashist orbit with varying degrees of conviction. This is what Margaret Garlick has called a, a group of disparate artists united by practice. And as Penelope Curtis has mentioned, for a brief moment in time, contemporary painting had more significance for Hepworth than contemporary sculpture. Jumped ahead slightly. seems to be in the wrong place. Sorry. Uh, when Hepworth writes about Tashism, one feels her excitement. And this style of drawing has therefore been described as representing the most en energetic, spontaneous, and joy joyful themes of her drawings and paintings. Uh, and they do. However, I have always felt there was a darker sensibility being expressed in these black scribbles and inky daubs. Indeed, the ink was so heavily applied, uh, perhaps angrily applied, it sometimes saturates the paper. This is my own personal digression, but I think they underline the fact that in 1957, uh, it was such an emotionally trying time for her, and the transition from carving to casting was not necessarily straightforward. And since Tashism was all about self-expression and sub channeling the subconscious, it seems entirely possible that these drawings emanated from a darker place. That aside, uh, there is a fascinating interplay between Hepworth's work in two and three dimensions at this point. And indeed, there is a distinct visual correspondence between the gestural style of the drawings and certain sculptures, notably Meridian and the small scale works which relate to it. The link between Hepworth's drawing and sculpture is complex, however. Uh, as Hepworth claimed that she often came to a sculpture with ideas fully formed and really had the need to make preparatory drawings or advanced sketches unless it was a quick sketch on the back of a fag packet. Cigarette packet, sorry, that was my... Uh, uh. Uh, moreover, uh, her approach is further complicated by the drawings and paintings in which she returns to ideas explored in earlier sculptures such as turning forms uh, drawing here from Kettle's Yard made four years after the sculpture of the same name. The linearity of Hepworth's drawings and paintings of 57 clearly relate to the profiles of the new sculptures that she had started to make. Though in fact, uh, she had already begun to explore the possibilities of the expressive line in her sculpture earlier in the 1950s. The synergy between the sculpture and drawings uh, applies as much to works in progress. There's one more there. In that the loopy black lines clearly echo the contours of the sheet metal and wire armatures, armat armatures that she had started to make in 1956. Uh, as much as they do the finished works made in aluminium, copper, brass and bronze, made before and after 1957. Together, they suggest that the direct relationship between her drawings and her sculpture uh, is perhaps more overt at this time than at any other. And it is therefore tempting to speculate that some of these drawings were perhaps more preparatory and not just exploratory, a sense that is further encouraged by her repeated use of project for sculpture in her titles. 
Despite the geographical remoteness of St. Ives, Hepworth was well aware of new developments and what younger artists were doing. In December 1957, she wrote again to Herbert Reed, Yet in another sense, I belong to the present. Apart from Ben's painting, it is Sam Francis, Soulage, etc., who moved me the most. Both Francis and Soulage were associated with Tashism, even though Francis was American, and both exhibited at Gampofis. Of the two, Soulage was probably the greater influence. He was partly the reason she enjoyed her time in Paris whilst completing work on Meridian, and she also owned a print by him that's now in the collection here. Unfortunately, records do not confirm yet whether she brought this print from Gampofis or if it was a gift, though the gal gallery feels it is likely that it did come from them. Tashism was important enough to Hepworth that she travelled to Cambridge with her son Simon to hear Herbert Reed lecture on the subject. In her letter to Reed uh, of December the 15th, 1957, she repeats her interest in attending the lecture and one feels her excitement for the subject. The amazing struggle between science and life in the organic and spiritual sense is reaching tremendously exciting and very, ter very terrifying proportions just now. The Tashists understand the present crucifixion. They heighten the awareness and give one wings to encompass this new life. But if men are to be born and women to sustain a normal pregnancy, the, uni the unique qualities of sculpture with its mysticism and, and magic must find their true forms, lasting forms and still forms. As a result of her enthusiasm, she subsequently invited Reed to give the same lecture at St. Ives for the Penrith Society. There's no text of this lecture that I've been able to find so far, uh, but the lecture was reviewed in the St. Ives Times and Echo, rather usefully, uh, which gives a wonderful account of its scope. The anonymous, I won't read it all out because it's quite long and time is against us, but if anybody's that interested, I can send it to you. Uh, but the anonymous correspondent says, and this dates it somewhat, the lecture was illu illu illustrated by lantern slides uh, of paintings by Kandinsky, Jackson Pollock, Mark Toby, Sa Sam Francis, de Buffet, Soulage, Sandra Blow, and others. There was also an interesting picture of infant scribbles showing their surprising purpose and growth and the existence in them of archetypal forms of universal symbols. And he or she, this is the correspondent, continues, the name Tashism is new but the form of art itself is less so. For, Kandin for Kandinsky practiced it as long ago as 1910, and there are even hints of it in Leonardo's advice to seek designs in the stones of moldering walls, in the folded blots of cousins. From the title of the medieval devotional book, uh, The Cloud of Unknowing, uh, Sir Herbert Reed drew a parallel with the state of mind of the modern painter. For, just as the seeker of spiritual perfection and union of the soul with God must relinquish surface reasoning and deliberate thought, so must the creative artist draw his images from the deep unconscious levels of his personality. Apparently, Herbert Reed ended by saying, this is all well and good, but you need a personality to express in the first place. I don't think there's any problem with that with Hepworth. The detail offered here ties the content of the lecture with texts wrote, Reed wrote for the journal Encounter in 1955, which is, a, which is primarily his reaction to an exhibition of painting at the Galleria Nazionale di Arte Moderna in Rome at the time of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. What he calls the various forms of the formless he notes, can be found in all the countries exhibiting, and in most countries, it's the predominant tendency, which included Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, Holland, Italy, Switzerland, and the USA. Uh, his thoughts were they later recycled in the revised version of his book, Art Now, published in 1960, in which he adds a new chapter dedicated to the final phase of abstraction, as he calls it. But by that point, Tashism is already waning in Britain, uh, and I have to say this is in Britain only, uh, and he gives more attention to action painting and abstract expressionism. Reading these texts illuminates how Tashism brought together wide-ranging interests both he and Hepworth shared, including children's drawings, Jung, Zen Buddhism, and especially Fossilion's life of forms. At this point, the understanding of existentialism, existentialism sorry, Zen Buddhism and Jung was largely derived from secondary sources. 
invoked to add a rigor and validity for an art form that was strictly intuitive and subjective, and that otherwise would be regarded as too self-indulgent. It was too early, it seems, for self-expression to exist without intellectual justification. I am now concluding, don't worry. So, Tashism was relatively a new word, hence something of a chameleon word. Uh, initially, it was used somewhat indiscriminately in Britain, along with art informal, abstraction lyrique, art autre, action painting, and even sometimes abstract expressionism. Um, there's a wonderful exchange of ideas between uh, Paris and New York with, with Britain in the middle, uh, but eventually the Ecole de Paris loses its precedence. Um, I am going to quote something which just made me laugh. For writers such as Lawrence Alloway, Dennis Sutton, and even Reed, there appears to be a struggle uh, with coming to terms with its impact. For Sutton, in his catalogue preface for the Metavisual Tachiste Abstract Painting England Today exhibition at the Redfern Gallery, he says, it seems to smack of rock and roll when one considers it in cold blood. Um, then, so, to conclude... Uh, Tachism in Britain, um, the coherence was based on the relationship of artists to their materials. That relationship was process dominant, which could have two possible meanings in this context. First, it meant the Tachet work was created spontaneously without recourse to preparatory uh, sketches or drawings. And second, it meant without exception, as far as it's possible to tell, that no attempt was made to conceal the process of fabrication by applying standards of fit finish to the end product. In reality, however, Tash's style works were simultaneously aleatory and deliberate. Hepworth's paintings, for instance, involved time-consuming preparations and processes made in advance before the, the more instantaneous, expressive curlicues and arabesques were added. Since Hepworth related making sculpture to the subconscious, this type of painting also had obvious appeal. Moreover, in the trauma left by the war, the potency of Tashism was precisely its lack of fixed meaning and thus its ability to imply a certain utopian idealism. Again, an idea that is borne out by Hepworth's expressed aims for her public sculptures such as Meridian. Thank you.